This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. Listen to the conversation between a doctor's secretary and Mr. Jones, who wants to make an appointment with the doctor. Now look at questions one to five on the form. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning, Dr. Ritter's office. Can I help you? Hi. Yes, I'd like to make an appointment to come in for a checkup, please. OK. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Jones. Peter Jones. And you want a medical examination? That's right. By the way, my name's Rebecca. I'm Dr. Ritter's secretary. Have you seen Dr. Ritter before, Mr. Jones? Actually, no, Rebecca. We've only just moved to Los Angeles two days ago. Great. Welcome to LA, Mr. Jones. Thank you. When would you like to come in? Any time this week would be fine. I don't have to go into office until next Monday. OK, let me see. But first, to see how long you'll need, could you tell me why you need the medical? My insurance company needs it, and my companies were in real estate. Medical insurance also wants me to have one. Kind of killing two birds with one stone. Sure is. Insurance companies want a fairly complete examination, so that means you'll have to come in the morning and don't eat or drink anything after midnight the night before. No problem. Let me see. Would 9am Thursday be convenient? 9am Thursday. No problem. Oh, I forgot. We have a meeting with my children's new headmaster that morning. That's at 11. Look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to more of the conversation between the secretary and Mr. Jones. Then answer questions 6 to 10. What school is that? Beverly Hills High School. Oh, that's no problem. The whole examination will take about an hour, maybe a bit more, and the school is only two blocks from here, a three-minute walk, so you'll have plenty of time. That's good. So 9am Thursday. You got it. Now, to save time when you get here, I'll ask you a few questions. Fire away. First, what is your personal medical insurance company, Mr Jones? Blue Cross. Blue Cross. And how old are you? 46 today. Happy birthday. Having a big party? Not really. We don't know anybody here yet, except for two neighbours. I think my family planned to take me out to dinner. A secret surprise, hey? OK, back to Blue Cross. I'm just checking what they need. Let's see. Blood pressure, standard blood and urine tests, cholesterol levels, ECG, checking for diabetes, heart disease, the usual things. Do you have a medical condition at the moment, Mr Jones? None at all, Touchwood. Fit as a fiddle. That's great. I'm sure you'll stay that way. And do you know the name of your company's health plan? Yes, I've got it here somewhere. Here it is, the Kaiser Health Insurance Company. Kaiser, yes. They need the same information as Blue Cross, so, as you said, killing two birds with one stone. That's right. And can I have your telephone number, Mr Jones? Sure. My cell phone is 13805 56721. 13805 56721. Right. And my home number is area code 805 523 0296. 805 
523-0296. And do you have email? Yes, the address is pjones12 at hotspot.com. pjones12 at hotspot.com. That's it. Well, that's all I need for now. See you Thursday, Mr. Jones. Sure thing, Rebecca. See you then. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You are going to hear an introduction to a group tour to Australia by George Martin, a travel company manager. First look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Morning Sun Travel. I'm Rick Smith, and I manage our group tours to Australia, New Zealand, and the South Sea Islands. It's good to see so many of you here. As you know, I'm going to introduce our latest product, the 21-day Grand Australian Tour. First of all, why did we develop this new tour? Well, our two-week Aussie tours have proved really popular over the past few years, so after doing some market research, we found that there's a demand for a longer tour. In fact, looking around, I see some faces I recognise. You two went on our Australian tour last year, right? Great. Good to see you back again. If you think I'm exaggerating about Australia, you can interrupt me. Another thing. It's a long way from England to Australia, and many of our clients think it's a pity to go all that way for just a couple of weeks. So, our first three-week tour will head off in early November, about three months from now. Now, if we dim the light a bit, I'll show you some slides of what we'll do and see down under. Our first stop will be Sydney. It's one of my favourite cities and we'll arrive mid-morning and check into one of my favourite hotels, the Five Seasons Hotel, Sydney. America's most popular travel magazine selected it as the best hotel in Australia. Believe me, it deserves every one of its five stars. It has fantastic views of Sydney Harbour, the famous Opera House and Sydney Harbour Bridge. And for those of you who were born to shop, it's just a short walk away from Sydney's major shopping and business districts great restaurants and bars, and for those of us who like to keep fit, there's a state-of-the-art spa and fitness centre with sauna and heated outdoor pool. We'll have lunch in the hotel, and then off we'll go to explore. No time for a rest. To get over jet lag, it's best to get out and do something energetic. Our first afternoon, we'll stroll around the harbour and visit the Sydney Opera House. Then we'll have a relaxed evening dining at Luigi's Place, one of the city's best Italian restaurants. Day two. Lots of fresh air. We'll have a day trip to the Blue Mountains, 
Just look at these slides. Wonderful views, complete with a walk through temperate rainforests. And these pictures are Featherdale Wildlife Park, the best wildlife park in Sydney, where you can feed kangaroos, have your photo taken with koala bears, and see over 2,000 different other types of Australian animals, including crocodiles, Tasmanian devils, wombats. Look at this picture of a wombat. Looks like a bear with short legs. And penguins, dingoes and snakes. Lots of snakes. Some of Australia's snakes are the most poisonous in the world. And you can also learn about Aboriginal culture. And this is fun. Try throwing a boomerang. As the talk continues, answer questions 16 to 20. And look at these slides. Australia's Grand Canyon, the Megalong and Jamison Valleys. Incredible. On the way back, we'll get in our bus and stop at the Sydney 2000 Olympic site, where you can see Stadium Australia, the Superdome, the Aquatic Centre, the Olympic Village, and lots more. So, day two, great day. But that's not all. After that, we'll take a cruise down the Parramatta River, under the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and into Sydney Harbour. Any questions so far? OK, let's see what we'll be doing on day three. Anyone flown in a seaplane? Oh, just a few of you. Well, a visit to Sydney would not be complete without viewing the world-famous Bondi Beach from 500 feet in the air, and this is a picture of Bondi Beach. We take off from Rose Bay, which is not far from our hotel. This should be a slide of Rose Bay. Yes, it is. You can see the seaplane taking off. Then we fly down the coast to Bondi Beach. Look at that surf. Returning back up the coast, we fly over Manly and Long Reef before returning to the harbour. Climbing to a height of 1,000 feet for a vista of Sydney Harbour, which will take your breath away. Look at this slide. And this one, wow! And then back to Rose Bay. Then it'll be time for lunch in Chinatown. That's a great thing about Australia. It's a country of immigrants. So in the cities, you can get just about any food you like. Greek, Chinese, Mexican, you name it. And perhaps you'd like to try kangaroo meat. Very low fat. And after a big lunch, we'll go to walk it off in Luna Park. I can't begin to tell you how much there is to see and do here. We'll just run through a few slides. Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say, to give you an idea. Hey, I see the coffee's here. It's a bit early, not to worry. Let's all grab a cup now, and then we'll move on to Melbourne, then the Great Barrier Reef, and all the other great places on the itinerary. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a tutor and two students discussing a business case study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Right, Jason and Karen, now I asked you to look at the case study for Box Telecom as part of your exam assessment. It's interesting because they're in the middle of problems at the moment and I want you to track how they deal with them. Um, let's start with you, Karen. Having read through the case study, can you just summarise what the problems were that Box Telecom had to take on board? Um, yeah. Um, well, of course, what first came to their attention was that despite a new advertising campaign, they were suffering from falling sales, and this is something that had many causes. On top of that immediate problem, what had also happened over the last two years was that although they had invested in an expansion plan, they had to face up to increased competition. And before they had a chance to get to grips with the effects of that, they were stalled by a strike. And it was just when they were thinking about making a colossal investment in new machinery for their plants. So they were really in trouble. Yes, I think that's fair. And, Jason, um, now you contacted the company, didn't you? Oh. What did the company define as the reasons for these problems? Well, I think they've hit on the right things. It would be easy to say they had invested too heavily or at the wrong time, but in fact the signs were good, and what they were set back by was high interest rates. Mm. At the same time, their longer-term problems, which were affecting their market share, were eventually credited to poor training. And having looked at the details in their last report, I think that's right. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So, on to the larger issues then. Karen, what do you think the company will do? Oh, well, obviously they have the choice of accepting the very favourable terms that another company, KMG PLC, have given them to buy them out. That would mean creating a new company with a new image. Or they could decide on a bolder move and offer some new shares if they wanted. But I think they're much more cautious than that and expect they will start trying to find individuals who'd be prepared to back them with some of the capital they need. Well, you mustn't always assume that dramatic problems require dramatic solutions. <laughs> Sometimes there's a simple fix, such as changing the guy at the top. If they truly are cautious then I suspect they will seek to shut down some of their shops. But a more ambitious approach, and one which I think would have more chance of success, would be to alter how they're running things, the management layers and the processes. So, in your analysis, try to think of all the options. Jason? Yes, it's interesting because I found it a really useful company to study. Its problems cross all types of industries, and it's lucky it's so big. A smaller or even medium-sized company would have gone under by now. Ah, well, in fact, what I want you two to do is to go away when we've finished our discussion today and write a report. We've looked in general at the telecommunications market in the UK over the last few sessions, and I want you to take Box Telecom as an example and suggest some ways in which they might overcome their problems and outline the reasons why you think as you do. But try and keep it intrinsic to the company rather than dragging in other examples. Is that OK, Karen? Yes, I think I can do that. Personally, I've got great hopes for it. I think it will recover. That advertising campaign they did was very strong, and they're very innovative with their products. They set new trends. The company's got to recover, don't you think, Jason? Mm, I'm not sure. I think it can, but it's not a foregone conclusion, unless they manage to attract the right level of investment. The company definitely needs a boost, and to attract more highly skilled workers if their recovery is to be long-lasting. 
when I was talking to the marketing manager, he said to me that he thinks the company had got a great management team. But he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> But they are suffering from having to work with outdated production machinery, and that could cost a lot to put right. Well, personally, I think the stock market is to blame. I think they were expecting too much of the company, and then inevitably it looked bad when it didn't perform. The market should have had more realistic expectations. And I disagree with you about the advertising campaign, Karen. That's where they could do with some innovation to get sales kick-started. Anyway, let's see what you come up with with those. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a university librarian giving a talk to new students. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Okay, are you all settled? Well, first of all, welcome to Cardiff University. I'm here to explain what we can offer you. Now, as a new student at the university, you will probably need some sort of guidance to help you to use the library effectively to study and research. Some of you have asked about a guided tour. But we find this rather muddles people. So, in this first week, we run a series of talks which focus on different aspects of the library and its resources. You'll also find that to get the most out of the library, you really do need to be computer literate. And so, all this term, we run small classes which will bring you up to speed on how to access the computer-loaded information. Okay, now let me give you an outline of what's available to you. You'll find that the computers are increasingly used as a research tool. Many students do most of their research on the internet, and the library computers are permanently online. Having found what you need, you'll find you can readily save texts on your personal computer space to print off when you need. You might think that it is the fastest way to get information, but the links can be slow. Clearly, you can find lots on there, but much of it is useless information, as it is from highly debatable sources. So be critical. You'll also find that the library has loaded several CD-ROMs onto the computers from specialist reference sources, such as the MLA. It means we can expand what we offer you at very little extra cost, and saves us having to invest in more and more books. The CD-ROMs contain exactly the same information as the reference books, as the two are updated together. Now, most of you will need to refer to journal articles in your work, and you'll find you can also access these online. And we encourage you to do so. Clearly, some of you will find the printed version more accessible as it sits on the shelves, but I'm afraid the intention is to phase these out eventually. However, you will still be able to print off a version of the text rather than photocopying the journal pages. So you must get used to working online. Naturally, we do still have the full range of classic reference books, additional to the CD-ROMs, for you to use, and there are several copies of each one. 
This is because some of you may prefer to borrow a book rather than sit in the library. There is a restricted loan time on these so that they are not missing from the shelves for too long. Although there is a section manager for each part of the library, they are very busy. And so, if you do get stuck looking for things, you should ask the relevant cataloguing assistant. As your training supervisor, I just oversee your induction and will not be around after this initial week. Some of you may be interested to know that the library is offering specialised training sessions on writing a dissertation. Obviously, this is not relevant to those of you who are undergraduates. It is just for postgraduates. Your department will discuss the planning stage of the dissertation, i.e. what you're going to do with you, and we will focus on the structure of it. However, the training will also include some time on the computers. I realise most of you know how to organise files, but we can show you the different ways to run data programs. Your tutors will tell you at the outset how to set out the chapters they require, but you will need to ask them how they would like you to organise the bibliography because it varies depending on your subject area. When you've got something together, the trainer here will look through the draft version for you to see if it's okay. And one final point, for those of you who have registered from abroad, we can offer individual sessions on dissertations if you feel you need them. If you require language lessons, then they are available from the International Centre next to the Law Department. That is the end of Part 4. You now have one minute to check your answers to Part 4. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.